our services. And I was sharing with the worship team this morning in the Bible. I was reading in First Chronicles. Chronicles. Michael goes, you always say that a little weird. Chronicles. There I go. Yay. And I was reading how when they were bringing the ark of the Lord, they prepared a way. They were worshiping. They had trumpets. They had a choir director. They were giving their everything to the Lord. And that's what we get to do today. Amen. We get to come before the Lord. We get to worship him with all of our hearts. So let's just posture our hearts right now. Just before the Lord Jesus, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we say, have your way today. Lord, I ask that we would not treat this as common to come into your presence today and worship you. I thank you, Jesus, for the privilege that we have as a body, as a family, as your bride to worship you today. We worship you. Just agree with me, church, for a moment. We worship you. Just tell them you love them. Just, just even sing out a new song in your heart before the Lord right now. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are, Lord. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins. We thank you, Jesus, that you did not leave us as orphans, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. It's our joy, it's our privilege to love you today, Jesus. May you feel loved today, Lord Jesus. We give you our very best, Jesus. We give you all of us, Jesus. We lay it at your feet, Jesus, all that we are in Jesus' name, Lord. We didn't come here today to just do church. We didn't come here today to just sing a song, Lord. We came here to worship the King of Kings. So we worship you today, Jesus. Have your way, heal your people, Jesus. Save the lost, set the captive free in Jesus' mighty name. We love you and honor you, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.
Tell him. Marvelous for words. Wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard. Just begin to sing in the spirit. Come on here for about a minute. Lift your voice, lift your voice, lift your voice. Oh, come on, we're close to a breakthrough here. I can feel it. Come on.
It's singing. I'm telling you, I feel a breakthrough. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people.
just begin to bless him now. Come on, open your mouth. Worthy, 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 worthy is the Lord. Holy, 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 holy. God inhabits the praises of his people. He's, en he's enthroned on the praises of his people. King Jesus, be enthroned. Be enthroned here. Oh, we love you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Can we just lift our hands? Holy Spirit, we welcome you to have your way and do whatever you want to do here, however you choose to do it. Lift Jesus so high this morning and be loved here. Be deeply adored here. Make us a Bethany. Come on, say that out loud. Make us a Bethany. Say it. Come on, make it our prayer. Make us a Bethany. Make us a Bethany, Lord. Make us a Bethany. Come and, come and recline here. Live with us. Live here. Live here. Rest here. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm very happy right now. Is anybody else happy? Come on, I want you to give the Lord praise. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you. I want you to do that one more time and don't tip the Lord, make it sacrificial. Come on, lift the praise. Come on. Jesus, 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 we love you. We love you. to grab a seat. Just stay with me, Joel. Thank you, worship team. Can we let the worship team know how grateful we are? Come on, let them know. Let them know. And for the next 10 minutes, I just want you to grab a seat and please don't move. There's a lot going on here I didn't used to believe in. We got dancers now and flags and all the stuff that weirded me out 10 years ago. That's all happening here. <laughs> so funny. Yeah, Ryan, could you shut that? I have a pet peeve. It's when that curtain stays open. I don't know why, but that's what happens when you... Served my father-in-law for 10 years. I want you to close your eyes and just say this out loud. Say, Jesus, I know you brought me here this morning. I want to say that three times and seal it. Jesus, I know you brought me here this morning. One more time. Now just look into my eyes, into these deep baby blue eyes. <laughs> Before you were ever born, the Lord knew you'd be here today. Now I know that sounds spiritual, but I really want you to ponder that for a moment. Before you were ever born, the Lord appointed this moment he knew the exact seat you'd be sitting in. Now I'd like you to think about everything God orchestrated to get you here. Like giving you the job to buy the car, moving on that boss's heart to actually hire you even though you weren't qualified. The 
My grandfather was injured as he stormed Normandy. He barely spoke English. He, he immigrated here to the U.S. and fell in love with the nation and immediately uh, enlisted to storm Normandy. And he was injured with shrapnel in the abdomen and nursed back to health over months in a French farmhouse, I believe by German doctors who took an oath to take care of people. My grandmother received a letter from the U.S. government that she was now a widow. And she believed she was for, I think, eight months. Now, when I look at you, I wonder what, what would have happened had he passed away in that farmhouse? All the souls that have come into the kingdom and bodies healed by the grace of God at Jesus' image would never have been had my, fa had my grandfather died in that farmhouse. And all of you have a similar story. I'm not asking you to just trace your life. Trace the generations prior to you. The Lord kept your, your grandparents alive and provided for them so you could be here this morning. That being said, Jesus is here in the room. He drew you to himself and even though our sin breaks his heart, he knew you'd be facing exactly what you're facing right now. He knew you'd be bound by what you're bound with. He knew you'd be struggling with what you're struggling with. And I think one of the great plagues of a people is monotonous, repetitious religion where we start to believe that our attendance checks off a box in the heart of God. And so there's all these weird thought processes, like, well, the Sunday night crowd's really wild, and you guys are the Baptist crowd. <laughs> and the meeting started a bit Baptist, and then you progress. But, 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 and I love the Baptist church, don't get me wrong. But you know what I'm saying. So all these thought processes, and we get stuck in the rhythm, and then we start actually believing that God is blind, that He takes a nap, and we've fallen into the trap of believing that if I repeat a prayer, I'm good to go. So the proof of my salvation is whether or not I responded to an altar call. That was not the proof of salvation in the Scriptures, certainly not in the local church, proof of salvation is the life of the Savior in us. And how many of you know Jesus is not bound with sin? The scripture says, listen very carefully, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. I said this last week. A great man said, if I have to wait until I'm dead to be free from sin, then I've made death my Savior and not Jesus. Now, I'm not saying you don't screw up, but I am saying when you are born again, you receive a new nature. And so we've just counseled people in their bondage, and there's nothing wrong with counseling, but there's much more to the born-again experience than just coaching you through your bondage. Jesus doesn't coach us through our sin. He destroys sin. He comes to destroy the works of the devil. And I'm standing here as living proof, not as a perfect man, but I can tell you, he sets the captive free. He sets the captive free. And you can be completely free. The thought process is, well, I'm, I'm not cheating on my wife. I'm not that bad. I, I'm not on drugs. You know, I... I don't lie very often unless April 15th is approaching. Because you know, God wants me to be blessed, so I just adjust numbers. Or but sin is not so much your adultery. Sin is not so much your porn issue. Those are sins that are symptoms of a greater issue.
So Jesus said, he who sins, uh, he who has the symptoms consistently is a slave of a greater master named sin. The nature of the sinner is to sin. And so Jesus dealt with sin at the root by living a perfect life, by fulfilling the entire law, by resisting temptation, not only for you, but as you. As you. Jesus fulfilled all of that as himself, for you, and as you, as your representative. When he took your sin and he was nailed to the tree, listen very carefully, when he took your sin, your sin was nailed to the tree with him. You say everything? Everything. Everything. That's why when Jesus prayed, Father, if there be another way, let it happen. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. When you look at the grotesque nature of the suffering of Jesus, it is a picture of the grotesque nature of our sin. Past, present, and future. Every person, listen to me, not only every action, every thought. Jesus hears our thoughts. That's why he laughed when Sarah mocked him when she laughed, or I should say when she laughed in her heart. He said, why did she laugh at me? He hears the thoughts of the heart. And the scripture says, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. And what does that mean? It means you don't know it's wicked because it's deceiving you. You, you think the heart is pure, but when we say, oh, I had, no, none of us had a good heart before Jesus. Let's just be real. Nobody here had a good heart before Jesus. Our hearts were hearts of stone and they deceived us and we were given a new heart for those of us who follow the Lord, hearts of flesh, soft hearts, to feel him and know him. Jesus took all of that sin, was nailed to a tree. And the Bible says, listen carefully, whoever hangs on a tree is cursed. Now the Bible teaches that Jesus, listen carefully, became the curse. Why did he become the curse? Because he took on your sin. That's why he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Curse means to be cut off. When Jesus became the curse, this is the majesty of the gospel, and he hung on the cursed tree. The cursed tree cursed your curse and canceled it. You all took algebra, two negatives equal a? That's the mastery of the gospel. That's why the Bible says, had they known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. The devil thought he was winning, but Jesus had a wisdom that was so lowly, it was galaxies higher. Because God always promotes the humble. I, with every head bowed and eye closed, listen carefully. The proof of being a Christian is a free life in Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, as God's servant this morning, that you can be free. You can leave here this morning completely brand new, not improved, but absolutely delivered with newness of life. Every sin you ever committed washed away. What does Jesus want of you? He just wants you. You say, Michael, that's me. I want to get right with God this morning. I want to get real with God. I don't want to hide anymore. I want you to lift your hand. You want your sin washed away. You say, Michael, God bless you. God bless you. I'd like you all to stand. Children, I want you to hear me if you're in the room. This is a little more difficult since children are in children's church. <laughs> but there may be a few. Listen carefully. If, if you raised your hand or you wish you did, and lastly, if you brought someone this morning and you feel like you need to look them in the eye and say, do you need to give Jesus your life? You know them. I want you to do the work of an evangelist right now and look them in the eye and say, I will take you down there. If you raised your hand or you wish you did, I want you to come forward right now. Come forward right now and give your heart to Jesus publicly. Many, many of you responded. I want you to come down right now and give your life to Jesus. Come on. Come. 
Come on. Come on. I don't want anyone coming down alone. I don't want anyone coming down alone. Come, come on. Come give your life to Jesus. Team, come on. Come on. Give. Thank you, Lord. Come on. You can come close. You come close. You come close. You come close. Team, I want you to surround them. Come. You can come close. Team, I want you. There's more coming. Come on. Give the Lord praise. This is awesome. This is awesome. Come give your life to Jesus. This is wonderful. This is awesome. Oh, come on. Give the Lord praise. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I want our whole team to surround them. There's more coming. Come on. Come on. Come give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. There's no one like him. You can come down with her. Come down with her. Come on, guys. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Yeah. I'd like all of you just to remain standing. If you came forward, just look me in the eye. God is not mad at you. He loves you. He drew you here because he loves you. And I'm going to ask this Jesus, who's changed our lives, to make himself more real to you than anyone in your life. So again, remember, there's no salvation in this prayer. There's salvation in the Lord. And I want you to talk to the Lord right now, the best you can, like a child. It's not about you getting the words perfect. It's about you giving the Lord your heart. Are you all willing to follow the Lord? Just look at me and nod at me if you are. Are you all willing to? Okay. Let's pray. I'd like all of you to stretch your hands. We're, gonna, we're going to pray this out loud, all of us. If you've come forward, just lift your hands to the Lord. Just as an offering, you give the Lord your heart. Say this, Father in heaven. Come on, loud. Father in heaven. I come to you today, having sinned against you, forgive my sin, wash me in the blood of Jesus, cleanse my soul, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross and shed your blood for me, that you were buried and raised from the dead. Three days, later. Three days later, you are the Son of God. You have ascended to the right hand of the Father. You the right of the Father. And you are coming back again, coming back again. To, rule to rule and reign forever. forever. You, are you are the King of Kings and the Lord of my life. Lord of my life. I, give my life. I give you my life. I repent of my sin. I, of my sin. I turn from the world. I turn from Satan, and I turn to you, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and live there forever. Me for you, and you for me. In Jesus' name, I am born again. Amen. Come on, everybody's better celebrate. You better celebrate. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just look at me if you come forward? A few things I want you to do every day to live a true, victorious Christian life. You do not have to get stuck in a cycle. You can get closer and closer to Jesus every day and burn for him more brightly every day. Number one, read your Bible. If you don't have one, we'll help you get one today. Number two, Spend time with the Lord every day. Does every day make sense? <laughs> okay, that's important. Every day. Go into your room, Jesus said, and close the door and be with your Father. And if you, you might be saying, I don't know how to pray, He will teach you and we'll do our best to help you. But ultimately, you just need to go in and be a child in His presence, okay? Number three, you need to be baptized in water. Tonight, we're baptizing people. It's a little early. We would just put you through a quick... Uh, process. So next month we're baptizing again. Tonight we'll be baptizing off West Colonial. That's very important. Baptism cuts you off from this age and the ways of the world and you burst out of the water and newness of life and the Holy Spirit will fall on you. Guaranteed if you come to him in faith. Amen? Okay. Number four, you need to be a part of a people in the presence of God. That's called church. If you feel led to come here, we'd be honored to have you. But if you don't, that's totally fine. Find a church 
that loves the Bible and that loves God's presence. It's very important. Find a church that believes the whole Bible and loves the Lord. Amen? Okay. Lastly, and I'm going to pray this right now. Lastly, I want you to ask Jesus to send the power of the Holy Spirit upon your life. The power of the Holy Spirit. And this is why that's important. Because other people need you to lead them to Jesus. Okay? All right. You guys just lift your hands and receive. I'd like everyone in faith just to stretch your hands. Wonderful Jesus, you told us to ask of the Father and that he would give us the Holy Spirit. And so right now, we as a church family, we stretch our hands towards these people and we look to you, the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit and fire, to come upon these precious, precious children of God and bathe them in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would use many of them to change people's lives in the gospel of Jesus. Use them greatly. Give them souls for your sake in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now before we thank the Lord for all he's done, John, read here. You can take your mask off, buddy. This is John. Wait, put your hands up here, John. John is going to meet you guys after service. So listen, all of you need to go straight. Where's the, the right out there. You're going to go straight to a table. It says new believers on it. New believers, you're going to meet with John. It's not to harass you. It's strictly so that we can equip you and help you in your journey with Jesus. All right, you're all going to go there. I say it every week. We don't lie after we get saved, right? It's a bad way to start. So we're going straight to John here, okay? Come on, let's give the Lord praise. You're welcome to go back to your seat. God bless you. Come on, give the Lord praise. Babe. <laughs> I think this is a great time to give. Come on, let's, we don't need to, let's just give generously. Let's just do it. This is a wonderful, man, what a, what a morning. What a morning. I do just want to quickly read you a scripture. How many of you read through the Bible consistently? Like you start in Genesis and keep it going. All right. We got work to do. But we're only three weeks in. So we will get you there. We will get you there. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Thank you, Joel. Joel is now on staff. Full time. Full time. I love that we have in shape Navy SEAL like musicians. I think that's one of the glories of this ministry. <laughs> I'll stop there. So powerful. Hmm. In Genesis 14, Abram, who became Abraham because God gave him his name, which is a separate teaching altogether, he inserted his name into Abram's name, rescues his nephew Lot and defeats the kings. And following the victory, we look at verse 18. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him. Melchizedek, I believe, now this is not doctrine. There are debates here, and I'm not saying you have to believe this, but I believe this was a theophany, a manifestation of Jesus, in that Melchizedek had no lineage, uh, there was no genealogy behind him, and his name is King of Salem, or Salem, peace. And I find it very interesting that he brings bread and wine to celebrate the victory. It sounds a bit like the Last Supper. The scripture here says, he blessed Abram and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and, he, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he, Abram, 
gave him a tithe of all. So part of the debate, and we're going to get to the place here where I don't even have to teach on this. I'm going to say that again. We are going to get to the place where I do not have to teach on this. Uh, just to be honest with you, as church family, uh, come May, um, barring a major breakthrough, our expenses are about to skyrocket because of facility use and rental costs. And so if we're going to take the mountain, we're going to have to take the mountain together. Uh, to see a city, a nation, and the nations change through the presence of God resting on a people, we're all going to have to put our swords on the table and get in there. Uh, and, and so the day will come where this will just be who we are. In the meantime, I'm going to give you little tidbits in teaching. One of the fallacies is that the tithe is law. But the tithe precedes the law. In that, the law, this is pre-law, Abram and Melchizedek. Okay, now, the scripture teaches that the greater blesses the lesser. So if Abram is receiving a blessing from Melchizedek, and Abram is God's closest friend, that means this Melchizedek is an amazing person. I'll leave it there. Following the victory, listen, and the arrival of Melchizedek and the eating of bread and wine, which speaks of fellowship with Jesus, Abram's natural response was, here's a tenth. And it precedes the law. This tells me this. The tithe is worship. It is not merely following the law. So to the people, listen, to the people who have been rescued by God and have tasted victory as Abram and Lot did, it is natural for them to give to the Lord. How many of you would say that God has given you a great victory? Anyone here feel like they may have been dead if Jesus would not have touched them? I do. I mean, if I had four hands, I'd put them up. I would be dead had the Lord not touched my life. I can tell you for sure Jessica would have been. <laughs> she would have been on America's Most Wanted. She, there would have been like a $100,000 reward for turning her in. Be signs on I-4. All right. We are deeply grateful. How many of you know the Lord has qualified us? Okay. Raul said something beautiful last Sunday night. The tithe is not about... Giving, it's about obedience. Yeah. It's really what it is. The tithe is elementary generosity. It's not even breaking in to generosity. It's proving to the Lord that we will steward what he's given us. And why is that important? Because the Lord said he will not trust us with our own goods until we can steward another's. And when we tithe, we steward what belongs to the Lord. Amen? All right, we should have the, I'm not getting into that mess. Uh, we have multiple numbers now and different services. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your love. Bless your people as they give to you. I thank you for miracles, Lord. I thank you for our land. Come on, come on. I thank you for favor with the county as we move forward. I thank you for favor with the builders. I thank you, Lord for miraculous provision for every family here and every business and every church represented and, and people, Lord, who need you to break through. And ultimately, Jesus, use this giving to shake the nation and the nations of the world for the glory of the gospel. Amen. Amen. If, how many of you do not have an envelope and you would like to give via envelope? Would you just raise your hand? All right. We have one there. All right. If you'd like to give by text to give, there is the number. And uh, if you don't want an envelope at all, you just want to put it in the buckets, you're welcome to come forward. God bless you. We'll be back in just a moment.
Crazy choir. It's a dangerous choir. We have some dear friends with us this morning. Pastor Randy and Miss Lucy Needham are here. I'd like you to stand. Pastor Randy pastors a great church. Miss Lucy. They, um, I can tell who the students are. They're the first ones up. The other ones, y'all can join Jesus School. We'd love to have you. Be great. Um, Pastor Randy serves on our board of directors, so it's a real privilege to have them here. And they pastor a wonderful church named The Dwelling Place in Houston, where we've had multiple Jesus events and just, just a special, special place for us. So Pastor Randy, would you come up and pray before I teach the word? Let's all honor and welcome Pastor Randy. Just pray. Pray that pray it'll be good. Yeah, okay, let's stand up. Can we do that in honor? That every time you come in this place, Jesus will meet you. And this is amazing what God is doing here. We want to bless you. And we just want to honor the presence of Jesus. That he will always be here. You will never lack. You will walk in miracles. Your family will be blessed. You enter into a life of journey. Father, we thank you you. for this journey. We thank you that you call this people. You have chosen them to be your bride. You have chosen them to be a lampstand in this city and in this nation. Lord, this is a covenant that you call them into. And I ask, Father, that they would just not attend, but their hearts would be covenanted to you. Yes, Lord. That they would be established. And, Father, I thank you, generations of their families will be changed forever. Father, I thank you that their their lives will become a lampstand. And, Lord, I thank you that we will walk in the dream that the Father's hearts that multitudes will come to Christ and that multitudes will be equipped and walk with you as disciples. We thank you, Father, for the pastor. We thank you for the pastors, the leaders, all that you're doing here. May abundant grace, Father, overflow them. We thank you for every person called to serve in this body. Lord, I thank you they're equipped, they're anointed, they're yes, precious, Lord. Yes, Lord. they're set apart for you. Thank, you. thank you, Lord, that everything that's done, Lord, you're watching, and it's precious to you. There'll never be a note played, a song sung, a sermon preached, that you weren't in attendance, that you weren't receiving. Lord, I thank you that you're jealous over this house. Amen. Your jealousy is upon them. And it is precious. Protect them, Father. Make them one heart, one spirit. Let vision explode in this house. Let destiny explode in this place, God. No limits, no boundaries. And let them bless the entire world. Let blessing flow to the entire world. Give them a voice. Give them a song. Give them a message of triumphant, beautiful Jesus be exalted and enthroned in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, receive that. Give the Lord praise. Let Pastor Randy know you love him. Would you do that? Love you. All right, let's grab a seat. Good Friday, by the way. It's just about here. We are meeting at the Apopka Amphitheater. We're going outdoors again. It's a mini Jesus 20. It will be equally as wild, if not wilder, in the best way. Uh, There we go. So it is totally free. We're going to meet at 7 p.m. All of our musicians, choir will be there, and guest worship leaders will be in, and many, many uh, wonderful men and women of God will be there. We're going to gather around the cross. We take this cross just about everywhere, or I think we have two now. Is this... A different one. Okay, well, we take the cross everywhere. We're going to put that right there. Uh, 
in the amphitheater under the awning there, and we're going to gather the city and churches. Many churches are coming. Other pastors are bringing their churches. It's really going to be a special night. My heart is that we'll see 10 to 20,000 people in the future gathering around the cross, different denominations, receiving communion, worshiping the Lord, preaching the gospel. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Paul Teske is actually coming. Uh, and this is funny. He, he, he said, can I wear my collar? I said, sure, Rev, why not? You got us in enough trouble last time. People were like, has Michael turned Catholic? I said, do you know how many Jesus-loving Catholics there are? First of all. Secondly, can, come on. He's a Lutheran. They started the Reformation. But I'm going to let you sound stupid for a while. And you can keep talking. So Rev will be there and uh, many others. I only mentioned Rev because of the caller. I thought it would be really nice. So be there. Uh, but to come, you have to register at uh, goodfriday.tv, which is an awesome URL. Um, be in prayer. This Wednesday is a big day uh, for our land situation, the building situation. Um, we've been working with the county diligently and attorneys and civil engineers, you name it. It's been a long journey. And um, some last-minute changes came to us about a month ago that were just last minute. I'm trying to be as honoring as possible. <laughs> um, but we've been working through them, and so we need, we need your prayer. I feel like there's a mountain in front of us, and this one we're going to have to push with prayer and fasting. A lot of what the Lord has done, he's just put on our lap. But this one kind of feels like we're going to have to go to war for. And we know how to do that, don't we? We know how to do that, I said. Yeah, praise is a weapon. Prayer and fasting is a weapon. All right. Miss Lucy, it's so good to have you here. I remember when I was in your green room, flying from your place to upper room, and I didn't eat, and she started crying. She said, but you haven't eaten, and she started weeping. And I go, what a loving, precious woman. How blessed are you, Pastor Randy? When your wife weeps over people not eating, that is a wonderful, wonderful woman of God. I love you, Miss Lucy. It's so good to have you here. All right, let's get into the scriptures, and then we're going to receive communion. Tonight is baptism night, which is a wild night. We'll begin at 6 o'clock, so make sure you're there early. I said early. Early. You know how to, what early means in Greek? That means real early. Get there early, get into your seats. All right. Holy Spirit, speak. Change us with your word. And show us Jesus. Amen. All right, we're in week two of our 48 million week series on the majesty of Jesus. It is quite possible that we will never get out of this series and that you will go to your grave having never heard another series at your home church. I'm going to preach Jesus until I go home. And Tommy Reed told me, if you ever change the subject, you will have failed the Lord. So when a great man of God says that to you, you listen. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 2. Again, we're talking about the majesty of Jesus. Verse 1, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Listen to this verse here. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Wow. Wow. I was with you in weakness, in fear, that makes you feel better, and in much trembling. Paul shook at the thought of preaching the gospel to the Greeks. As a Greek, I can tell you, we feel like we invented oxygen. <laughs> so I, I, I totally understand this. It's very like a, <laughs> I heard a Greek theologian the other day say, uh, Somebody just prayed, Lord, let your Holy Spirit fall 
on the Greek church. And the, one of the guy responded, he, the guy literally said, we were there in the beginning. It started with us. I thought, what do you mean it started with you? You were there? You were in the upper room? You were not in the upper room. Those were Jews in the upper room. But, so I understand what Paul is dealing with here. <laughs> I was with you in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. One of my concerns, and I'm just saying this, I'm not knocking it, but it is concerning to me, and I, I pray that my generation of leaders finds the balance here, is our intense focus on the skill of communicating. The natural skill of communicating. In fact, there are many church workshops that teach you how to communicate better while you're preaching. Which is fine as long as you're communicating substance and not a topic. It is one thing to communicate Jesus. It is another to communicate a subject. Paul said here, and we're talking about one of the most learned theologians on planet earth at the time, if not the most combined with an incredible anointing, trained by the best, wrote over half of the New Testament, and through him, his team, and ultimately the power of the Holy Spirit, Christianized much of Europe and Asia Minor. He says right here, I determined to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. That's why that cross is behind me. I personally think that's more... Powerful, just that simple emblem of the cross and the coolest backdrop LED you could have. Now, we're going to have an LED, but it's not going to have like glittery unicorns and portals behind us. <laughs> it's going to have Jesus. All right, don't let me get started. That's a Sunday night posture. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let, me be, let me behave here. All right. I determined to know nothing among you, he's speaking to the church, except Jesus and him crucified. This tells me that it actually requires a choice on our behalf to take a step back and say, I will stare at Jesus my whole life and no one and nothing else. If I preach, I will preach Jesus. If I pray, I will pray to Jesus. If I write songs, they will be from me from Jesus and to Jesus. If I build a church, I'll refuse to build it and let him build the church. And he gets to build the church and make it all about him. You have to determine this in your soul. I felt this morning as I woke up that many of you are believing for your children to become closer to the Lord. And many of you are heartbroken over the decisions they've made and the distance between them and the Lord right now and where they were when they were younger and where they are today. I just felt this very strongly today as I was getting ready. When Jesus becomes real, he is just about irresistible. I mean, you, you can resist him, but you got to try. My advice to you would be, for you to draw near to Jesus, learn to minister to him so that he fills your home. So that they will taste and see that the Lord is good. It's not enough to tell our children what is wrong with the world. And by the way, there's plenty wrong with the world. I'm not negating that. But the way to keep them out of the world is not by trashing the world. The way to keep them out of the world is to expose them to the beauty of Jesus. You have to determine that. You actually have to determine to know nothing but Jesus. So if you're a counselor, yes, there are steps involved. I understand that. You process your pain. I've, I've been counseled, and it was glorious. But you want to counsel people into the presence of Jesus. If you don't, you'll counsel them into your presence. If you're a teacher of the word, 
teach people into the presence of Jesus. Or you'll teach them into your thought processes. And that's where we build camps. I love what Bill says. He says, don't, have, don't try to muster up faith. Just have faith in the faithful one. Stay close to the faithful one who is full of faith. That's why he's faithful. If you minister to the Lord and he comes, you won't have to beg him to heal the sick. He'll heal them before you ask him. Many times I've seen it. So Paul says here, I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why Jesus and him crucified? Write this down. If, listen, if you pursue crucifixion without Christ, you pursue religion. It is impossible to lay your life down long term unless you put it in the hands of Jesus. You take Jesus off the cross, now you have religion that majors on telling people what not to do. Okay, and that's what the cross does, by the way. It is meant to kill us. Let me just be very clear. God has the right, <laughs> this is amazing theology, ready? God has the right to say no to us. I know you're like, what? To me? Yeah. God remembers the time when there were no cell phones. Many of you in the room are like, is that when the dinosaurs were roaming the earth? No, no, there actually was a time. There was a time where you talked to people. You remember those days? Like, if you had an argument, you'd talk to them. Now... Basic communication goes through a direct message. And if I really want to get confrontational, I will text you. And if I want to tell you off, I will put a period at the end of the sentence. Okay, I've learned all this. Leading millennials and Gen Z, I'm learning all this. Don't put a period there. They're going to be mad. At, they're going to think you're mad at them. Really? It's just punctuation. I thought I could put a period there. No, you can't, but you can't do all that. There was a time. There was a time where if you had an issue, you actually walked up to people and said, hey, that hurt me. Let's work it out. May it return here. That's the way that Jesus' people live. All right. So God remembers the time when there were no cell phones. If you want to think about your limitation, God remembers a lot, and most of it happened prior to our existence. All right. God has the right to say no to us. So the cross is really a death mechanism. Absolutely. But if you take Jesus out of that, you live a life of religion, as I said, trying not to do the wrong thing every day, only strengthening it. All right. If I preach a Jesus who did not die on the cross, I preach a false Jesus who is a philosopher. He can't even be a good teacher if I take the cross out because he came as the Lamb of God. Does that make sense to you? So I have to preach Jesus and him crucified. The Jesus with holes in his hands. In the early church, if somebody said they had a visitation from Jesus, the first thing the fathers or the, the bishops in those days would say is, did he have holes in his hands and feet? If he did not, it was not the Lord. Christ and him crucified. All right. Matthew 20. For, uh, Matthew 22, verses 41 through 45. I'm so glad I hear Bibles. Thank you, Lord. Matthew 22, 41 through 45. While the Pharisees were assembled... Jesus asked them, now this is it right here. Jesus asked them, what do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? Lord saying, 
The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Listen carefully now. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? The chief question, as my father-in-law said in school last week, is this regarding the majesty of Jesus. What say you of Christ? Your eternal destiny rests in the answer to that question. What do you say of Jesus? Doctrinally speaking, you get this right, you're going to get most of the Bible right, if not all. If Jesus is son, certainly he has a father. If he is Christ, he is anointed by the Spirit. The Trinity is real. In other words, if I get Jesus right, if I hit the mark there, I get it right. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. I'm going to read out of New King James this time. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. You know what I love about this? You may not even know it, just like you don't know it when you're eating well. You are building stature in your soul right now. You are, you've got to just trust me. As you chew on the bread of life, it may be a slow drip, but I am telling you, it is putting roots down in the spirit. And, and the day you go home to be with the Lord, you will close your eyes in victory. You'll look at your family and say, I'm more in love today than the day I was born again. The word of God is powerful. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, underline John the Baptist. Some Elijah, underline Elijah. Others Jeremiah, underline Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets, underline prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, say amen, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bariona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the, kings, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Wow. Number one. Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. This is amazing. It is named after Caesar, obviously, and then Philip the Tetrarch. And the Romans occupied this city and eventually the Greeks. Now listen to this. The Jews called... Caesarea Philippi, the gates of hell. Let me tell you why. There is a massive hole. You're gonna, you, this is going to blow, blow you away when you see the wisdom of Jesus. There's a massive cave, cavern, built or naturally at the base of a mountain that water would gush forth from. A spring would come out of there. And it would feed the Jordan. In front of that massive cave, one day I'll show you guys a picture, and we're going to do an Israel tour. So, yeah, you'll love it. It's going to be great. In front of that opening, there was a temple to Caesar, a temple to Zeus. Listen to this. Another temple called the Temple of Pan, or Pan, which was the fertility god of the Greeks and Romans that was half goat and half man. All right. There was also an upper tomb and a lower tomb, two pan that glorified death. 
at the gate, this is very important, at the gate of hell, you had idolatry to government and political leaders, the, the temple of Caesar. You had babies being thrown in to the gate and drowning in the water. Live kids, they'd throw them in. You had uh, sexual immorality at, at the temple of Penn to the degree that bestiality was going on right there in front of the spring source. And there were tombs. So you see the glorification of death, the glorification of politics and government. Listen carefully. The killing of babies and the temple of Zeus that speaks of a false gospel and false worship. All at the gates of hell. It was so evil in the front of that cavern that the Jews were not even allowed to go. They wouldn't even get near it. So Jesus takes his disciples to the gates that they thought were the gates of hell. Obviously, we know they're not actually the spiritual gates of hell. But in Jewish culture, where Jesus was taking his disciples was a no-no. So he walks them to this horrible place, and he says this. There's a revelation available. Listen carefully. And if you get this revelation, everything going on there, behind us, at the gate of hell, everything going on will be destroyed and will never prevail against the church I build based on that revelation. See, so hold on here. Everything going on at the gate of hell is going on today. Everything going on, Caesarea Philippi, is going on today. Everything I just named is happening not in a foreign nation, right here in America. Listen carefully. And as much as it grieves Jesus, it does not scare him. In the least. In fact, he has a remedy to destroy the gates of hell. Do you want to know what that remedy is? Thou art the Christ the son of the living God. See, here's the problem. We get so caught up in the arguments at the gates of hell, yeah. trying to stop it all, that we don't sit still long enough to actually catch the revelation of Jesus. And so we are defeated by the gates of hell because we can't see the Lord of the church. When Jesus calls Peter a pebble, actually, or small rock, he said, I now call you Peter. You were Simon. Now I call you Petros in the Greek, which means a small rock or a pebble, which I'm not sure was super encouraging, <laughs> though pebbles are hard. So Peter was tough. I'm sure he dug the gold out of that one. Like, I'm a, you are a small rock. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how, if the Lord told me that, I'd be like, I love you too, Jesus. You are a small rock. Upon this rock, Petra, Petra, upon this massive rock, the revelation of who I am, I will build my church. Now let me be really clear. The gifts of the Spirit are so important, but God doesn't build his church on the gifts of the Spirit. The prophetic is important, but God doesn't build his church on the prophetic. Of course we want to be generous and blessed, but God does not build his church on the revelation of blessing, though it's needed. God will not build his church on having the proper political view, though you should, but that is not the foundation of the church. Jesus has been very clear. I will build my church with one rock, one substance, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And if you get that, you destroy everything going on at the gate of hell. It's the one-stop shop. I'm telling you. If you see Jesus rightly, 
You will have to argue about less issues that the church is arguing over right now. It's, 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 if you're going to go into that battle, make sure you're burning with love for Jesus. God is raising up lovers, a bride, not mercenaries, who have their own sword, their, our own logic, as stupid as it sounds. To some, this is our sword. The revelation of Jesus fixes it all. America will see renewal and revival when it sees Jesus rightly. Not speaking with man's wisdom. Paul said, I didn't use any of that. I came in the power of the Spirit and I determined to know nothing except Jesus and Him crucified. So this is, this is my invitation to you this morning. Um, much of what the church has been fighting, and it should stand in the gap and fight. Much of what it's been fighting hasn't been resisted. It's, it's multiplied. Let's just be real. I don't know if you've turned on a commercial lately, but the world is changing very quickly, and a lot of it's really grieving. I mean, I literally, when I watch TV with my kids, I have the remote in my hand, ready to change the channel at any moment. Okay, the church fasted more and prayed more, evidently, in the last year than I've ever seen the church fast and pray. Yet the problems are increasing. True or not? Okay, you just have to be real. Maybe the church entered a war without keeping its eyes on Jesus. See, logic has replaced worship. The Amalekites attack. Moses goes to the mountain. He looks for, to assistance. He says, hold my hands up. I know what to do. As long as his hands are up, the Amalekites lose. What? Who are the Amalekites? Idol-worshipping idolaters who hate God. And Moses says, I know the remedy. Give me five more minutes. David, listen carefully. I feel the Lord now. David goes to live with the Philistines. The house of Saul is trying to kill him. David tells the king, I'll fight with you against Israel. The Philistine commanders say to the king, no, no, we don't want him. Because this guy has killed Philistines for a living. Like he had to collect, <laughs> well, Saul demanded foreskin just to get <laughs> His wife, I mean, that's a wild thing. But anyways, that's what David did. So clearly he, he was pretty vicious. He killed tens of thousands of Philistines. And they knew that. They were, we're not going into battle with this guy. He'll turn on us and destroy us. So the king says, no, you cannot go. So he goes back to Ziglag, where he had been camping, basically, with him and his mighty men. And when they get there, everything they had is gone. Even their wives and their goods. Why? I'll tell you, you embark on a battle that is not yours, that God has not called you into, the devil will come through the rear and take everything you have. You better know your fight and stay in it. Don't take up somebody else's battle. I asked my father that, how can I last? He said, number one, spend time in the presence of Jesus. Number two, Find Jesus in the scriptures. Search for him. Number three, stay loyal to your calling. So David loses everything. Now God gives it back to him. But he loses everything because he embarked on a battlefront that God did not call him to embark on. How does he get it back? The Bible says he calls for the ephod. And he wraps himself in the ephod. What does that speak of? The secret place. Worship. Agreement with God and those around you. He takes the ephod, wraps it around him, 
and God restores double, God says, go take it back. Listen, listen carefully. Moses saw an entire nation destroyed, the Amalekites, because he lifted his hands to the Lord. And I feel this is a prophetic word for us. Listen very carefully. That we would literally be a people who actually believe it is just about loving Jesus. As stupid as that sounds, may our fruit speak for itself long term in our lives and our families. Amen. Amen. Let's take the communion elements. Joel, if you'd help me, please. Let's come to the table of the Lord. I'd like uh, Ryan and John Reed to come up. Dion. If you're there with your families right now, I want, I want to encourage you to come together right now or you're with a friend or a group come together right now if there's anything that you need to agree on together I just want you to whisper into that person's ear or you don't have to whisper in their ear just whisper to them it'd be a little, <laughs> little trippy but just whisper to them share, their, share your need with them let's come to the table of the Lord in faith I specifically want us to be in faith for the young people of the families of this church to burn for the Lord. Come on, let's believe that, 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 that our children and our grandchildren would burn for Jesus. Amen. Father, we come by faith today. And I thank you, Lord, for the beauty and the power of your body and blood. Is the bread that is broken not the body of the Lord, is the cup that we bless, not the blood of Jesus, your word says. And so we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us of our sin, Lord. Wash us clean again. Oh, Jesus, your blood speaks a better word. Wash us clean. Cleanse us, I pray. Forgive our words, our deeds, our motives, the intents of our hearts. Wash us, Lord. Now we lift the bread of the covenant, the body of the Lord Jesus. We lift this bread. And we confess, Lord, that your bread is true, that your body is true food, that you are the bread of life. And I do pray that as we receive the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was wounded and beaten, scarred, that healing would flow through every person here, every ailment, weakness even, every pain, every disease. I come into agreement with everybody here. As one family, we agree that you will heal those who are sick and in pain right now, that you would heal unhealthy minds, that you would heal memory, that you would heal effects of COVID and all this stuff, Lord, you would heal. We receive the bread of life by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we lift the cup, the cup of the new covenant that is in your blood, your word says. So right now we plead the blood over everyone, over every family represented here, over every business, over every church, over every person listening, watching around the world. We plead the blood over you. We, we plead the blood over every body, over every disease. The blood speaks a better word. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin and the protection of the blood. In Jesus' name, let's receive. I want you guys just to take the next minute.
and ask that person next to you if there's anything that you can agree on now that we're in the presence of the Lord. I just want you to take a few minutes and go ahead and pray out loud for that person next to you. If there's a a need, I want us to stand in the gap with one another. If there's someone in your family and they're not here and you know they need Jesus, pray for them now. I want everyone to get in on something. No, No spectators. If you see somebody just sitting there, ask them. Ask them how they can pray. Thank you, Father. Big prayers. Big prayers. Pray big prayers. There's nothing impossible with the Lord. Pastor Randy and Miss Lucy, I feel like the Lord's going to give the boys a divine wisdom. Like an, an actual wisdom. That... Where there's that, that ability to see the blueprint, and 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 uh, build in an honoring way, with the understanding of the cost that you have paid, the ability to be themselves, but to really understand the blood, sweat, and tears, the trail behind them, which will help them not only take things to higher levels but to to uh, keep the ancient landmarks that they not move I, I believe the Lord's going to do that that they'll see the end from the beginning the best they can the divine divine components that are needed the word and worship and prayer and how they are all needed in a people family and covenant, all these wonderful Jesus-like qualities. Father, do it in Jesus' name. Do it. Do it, Lord. Hallelujah. Would you all stand to your feet, please? I'd just like to pray a blessing over you, a big one. So come on, let's receive it. Listen carefully. Lift your hands to the Lord. Let's receive this. May the joy of the Lord be your portion. May the peace of the Lord be your reality. May righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit be the reality of your life. And may the love of Jesus burn brightly in you every single day. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Can you seal that with praise and thank the Lord? All right. All right. Okay. If you need prayer, I'd like our prayer team to come forward, please. Prayer team. If you need prayer, listen to me. Listen very carefully. For anything that needs God, I want us to become a people who go to brothers and sisters in prayer, in faith. And I want you to come forward, as I said last week, not to receive prayer, but to receive the miracle that you need. All right, you come in faith. You can line up right here in the center aisle. This is our team. They are highly trained ninjas, and they they know what they're doing. Love you so much. I will see you tonight, 6 p.m. God bless you. Bye-bye. That Jesus yielded his life to the Father.
He was buried in a tomb. And three days later, gloriously raised from the dead. The blood won. I said the blood won. demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus shed his blood. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead on the third day to give you life and to prove that he is the Son of God who he said he was. Today he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And for those who belong to him, he is interceding for them eternally. And that same Jesus will return again. He will crack the eastern sky like a whip. And with ten thousands upon ten thousands, he will return in glory. In 2017, we received a word from Lou Engel that we really believe is the word of the Lord for our school, our house, and the entire ministry. Lou said that the greatest musicians in the world, and the greatest vocalists in the world, the greatest worshipers, that they would descend upon Orlando, Florida to Jesus' image. And that word began to burn in us, and we began to dream about what it would look like to one day have a school where people would come to worship Jesus and be in his presence and receive his word. And a church was birthed in that same worshiping atmosphere. And what a beautiful opportunity that we have as a Jesus people to come before him and to be at his feet and to pour ourselves out before him. Worship has the potential to unlock things that really nothing else in the world can unlock. And so we decided about a year ago to launch a, an opportunity within the Jesus School setting for those worshipers, for the musicians, for the singers, for the dancers, for the artists, for the poets. And this is going to be a place where you can come and you can learn and you can grow. And we have highly trained instructors who are gonna be coming they're going to be teaching instruments. They're going to be teaching vocals. Anything that you can think of with worship, it's going to be there. The worship is not about us. We worship for Him. So we want to invite you to come. Come worship the King of Kings with us. So come and be a part of what the Lord is doing. Come and give your heart to the Lord. Come and surrender yourself to the Lord. And let's be ones that are willing to rise and go. And we decided to name it After Bethany, that wonderful house where Jesus was ministered to, that place where the feelings of Jesus were preeminent. It was a place where he desired to not only move and work and teach and do wonderful things, but a place where he would be adored, a place where he would rest, a place where he would run to so that he would receive ministry. And so now Jesus School, has this space that's been created 
for all of you who are desiring to use your vocal gifts, your instrumental gifts, your gifts of worship, the dancing gifts, and give them to Jesus. That Jesus would make this a Bethany, that he'd make our lives a Bethany, where he'd come and rest and recline among us.